Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. I'm very happy to be with you all today. My name is Sananafa, and I'm the Senior Program Specialist at IDRC for the Innovating for Maternal and Child Health in Africa initiative, known as IMSHA. I'll be moderating this webinar today. Thank you all for joining us from all across Canada, from Africa, from many parts of the world. So welcome all. Bienvenue tout le monde. Let me pass the floor to my colleague Heidi to introduce the IT arrangement and how to use the Kudo application. Please, Heidi, go ahead. Thanks, Sana. So just a, a quick note, um, the presentation today is going to be in English, but there is French translation if you would like that. And the way you access it is on the bottom left hand side of your screen. You uh, select where it says floor, you select the language of your choice. Je vais juste me répéter en français euh, rapidement. Alors aujourd'hui, vous noterez que la présentation sera faite en, en anglais, mais il y aura la, la the presentation today will take place in English, but simultaneous translation into French is available. Therefore, you just have to go uh, at the bottom of your screen where you see floor, you can choose your uh, language. Discussion period. And we'd really like to hear from you about your, you know, any questions or thoughts and reflections that you have from what the speakers are saying. Uh, we'll take them all at the end because we're going to have four presentations. And uh, you can note your questions in the chat box. You'll see that the messaging function um, already has uh, a, few, a few notes in it. Uh, there's one in the participant tab. That's where we'll be taking questions for the speakers. Um, if you have, and you're welcome to write any questions that you have in English or in French. If you have any questions of technical nature, you're having difficulty connecting, Ben, uh, our operator today, it will help you out and you can reach him in the operator tab uh, right beside. Um, so that's about it. Uh, the only other thing I'd like to note is that today's presentation is going to be recorded. And so I'll pass it back to you, Senna. Thanks. Thank you, Heidi. Uh, as we know, gender is a very important determinant to access the health services. And the IMSHA initiative did its best to include and integrate the gender and equity dimension as cross-sectional teams in all its 28 research projects across 11 African countries. And today we will highlight the uh, gender and equity lens on one of the very interesting research projects implemented in Tanzania and Uganda. And please have the second slide. The research team implemented two uh, research projects within IMSHA. One is replicating the Mamatoto, and they were lucky to have also the Synergy Grant to address barriers and enablers to gender equity and to scale it up in Tanzania. Our research team is from Catholic University of Health and Allied Sciences in Lake Zone, Tanzania, known as KUHAS, and the University of Calgary and Mbara University of Science and Technology in Uganda. I'll introduce the, uh, our uh, uh, speakers and I'll, then we will have the presentations and then we will have time to answer your questions. Please go ahead and have your questions uh, during the presentations, and then we will start to address these questions. Today, our presentations will be uh, given by uh, very impressive speakers. We start by Ilyanor Turiakira, she's a senior lecturer in epidemiology and biostatistics at Must University. 
in Uganda. She has more than 10 years experience in maternal child health research programming, and she leads a study on health literacy among rural population in rural southwestern Uganda. And we have Juliet Kabariki, and she's a pediatrician at the Bugando Medical Center, a lecturer since 2016 at KUHAS, and she's a technical team member in the Mamatoto project, and she worked on building capacity in many primary healthcare interventions. And we have also Hadija Molet. Hadija has master degree in public health from KUHAS, and she's currently working as nutrition officer and public health specialist at Bugando Medical Center. And she's a national community health worker tutor and technical advisor for community engagement at Musungi District and a member of the Synergy Grant especially on male engagement. And we have Dismas uh, Matovelo. Dismas is our principal investigator for both research projects in Tanzania. And he is a gynae obstetric specialist and senior lecturer at KUHAS. And he led the two projects Perfectly, they started by implementing the health facility improvement, addressing many functions of the health system, and their end line survey showed tremendous, uh, significant improvement in the health system. And then the Synergy Grant showed very good results because it was qualitative research and they could address the qualitative issues at the community level. We start with our presenters and thank you so much for being today with us. Please go ahead. Thank you, Sana. Good afternoon, good morning, everyone. So we'll start by looking at uh, the main issues around vulnerability of women and the context of access and utilization of reproductive maternal newborn and child health services in Tanzania and Uganda. So access and utilization of reproductive maternal newborn and child health services in Tanzania and Uganda is affected by issues that um, increase women's vulnerability but also issues of power imbalances uh, between men and women. And there are specific um, barriers that affect uh, adolescents and illiterate women. In the case of Uganda, reducing um, the gap in terms of health equity, reaching the most vulnerable populations is a policy priority. Conventionally, uh, such populations are identified by criteria like income, ethnicity, uh, education, and rural status. In the last two decades, MAST has worked with the University of Calgary uh, and districts in southwestern Uganda towards improving maternal newborn and child health. And this includes a three-year intervention between 2012 and 2015 that was funded by Global Affairs Canada. This intervention uh, involved establishment of a functional community health worker network. The next slide, please. So we have uh, found that using conventional categories of vulnerability, uh, many women in target communities of rural southwestern Uganda will qualify as vulnerable. So we ask ourselves, how can we better identify the most vulnerable women in such communities? Can community health workers reach the most vulnerable women? In seeking to better understand vulnerable women in our local environment, we undertook a sub-study using qualitative methods. 
The next slide, please. The next slide, thank you. So we did focus group discussions with community health workers and community leaders. And as well, we did individual interviews with women who had those conventional vulnerability characteristics. Uh, these women had, were extremely poor and in addition had at least one of the criteria like being a young mother, having many children, uh, physical disability or living with HIV AIDS. The data was translated, it was coded and thematically analyzed. The next slide, please. Our findings. We found that there is a mismatch between community and conventional definitions of vulnerability. Beyond the conventional uh, criteria, the conventional definition, community members identified categories like family alcoholism, living in fishing villages, and women being neglected by partners as indicators of vulnerability. Also, we found that these community members said it was easy for them to identify such women. So excessive family alcohol use was a significant uh, category and generated a lot of discussion during the field data collection. So uh, we wanted to see how does excessive alcohol use in a family actually um, lead to vulnerability of women. So we found that excessive alcohol use by men fosters negative male power against MNCH and that it nurtures the negative peer pressure among men. Participants reported that in families where there is excessive alcohol consumption um, by the man, such men will tend to use abusive and oftentimes degrading language to talk back to their women when women have expressed their request to visit health facilities. And when women are, uh, you know, talked back to in such terms, like, you know, being called useless, uh, that they will tend to give up uh, in their search for facility-based services. Also, participants reported that excessive family um, alcohol use will lead to increased household poverty because the men, the women who are involved do not work, they do not save, so uh, there is poverty um, created. And as well, for the women who drink in excessive amounts, we found that they will tend to forget their health facility visits, including antenatal care. The next slide, please. Then, there were additional factors that were reported, which are barriers to MNCH care. Factors including the lack of disposable income, uh, things like women who have had prior home births, uh, he prior healthy home births, and tend to think that even the next birth is going to be healthy and uh, women who live in households where there is a practice of witchcraft that such um, factors would make women vulnerable as far as access to MNCH uh, services is concerned. As well, participants reported that giving birth to only female children was a big issue that would uh, predispose women to vulnerability uh, because they will lack the support of their husbands and extended family. We also found that there is a fear of polygamy among some women that can predispose them or that can make them vulnerable. That for such women, they think that if they go to a health facility and spend there uh, some days, maybe during delivery, that that absence might create a gap that the husband exploits to bring another woman in the home. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. 
So while we have seen these uh, barriers, these different forms and causes of vulnerability, we also found that a community health worker centered, centered model can change the course of vulnerability. Um, our community health work model was tested in 2012 and 2015 that we call the Mamatoto model. Um, since health workers to be uniquely, community health workers to be uniquely positioned such that they can be able to uh, get the men and women talking about their concerns that are related to maternal, newborn and child health and the community health workers provide support and eventually they get men involved. Some of these community health workers have been vulnerable themselves, so they understand the situation of vulnerability. And in addition, these community health workers link health facilities to the communities, thereby increasing the confidence of vulnerable women to seek services at health centers. The next slide, please. So what have we done with these results? Uh, the results, we shared them with uh, the districts where data was collected, and as well, we shared them with the national stakeholders for input and, uh, and action. Also, uh, currently, we are developing a map of uh, women vulnerability for district health teams and their partners to use in advancing the cause of uh, targeted programming to reduce uh, the health equity gap. In addition, there is a new adolescent sexual and reproductive health project uh, that is uh, to be implemented by Mbarara University and the University of Calgary in southwestern Uganda, and it will consider these community determined vulnerable groups in its implementation. The next slide, please. The next slide, please. So, in summary, um, we have found that the conventional definitions of vulnerability differ from the knowledge of vulnerability by the community members. And that when we use conventional definitions alone, we may miss some of the women who are truly vulnerable and may classify some people as being vulnerable when actually they are not. Also, uh, we notice that these community members, as they have a different sense of vulnerability, it's important to engage them in identifying vulnerable women if we are to reach them. In addition, that volunteer community health workers, they are uniquely positioned to identify and support these vulnerable women and uh, who may actually not seek care if they are left on their own. Moreover, uh, in the context of uh, threats like COVID-19, we have seen that uh, threats like COVID-19 tend to disproportionately impact um, the situation of vulnerable women and they, they, they need support, including like, the responses for COVID-19, uh, the lockdowns, the, 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 the use of uh, sanitizing and hand washing facilities that vulnerable women will, tend, will need to be supported more. Also in conclusion, we have noted that the Mamatoto approach that has been tested that approach to build functional community health net worker networks, that it can help to increase readiness of community health workers to be able to reach their communities and reduce the impact of vulnerability. Thank you. Thank you. Julius, I think we're going to go straight over to you. Are you able to uh, unmute yourself? Hi, everyone. 
Thank you, Sana, for a wonderful introduction. And uh, on behalf of the team, I'm delighted to present on power and balance and vulnerability of adolescents in accessing reproductive, maternal, newborn and child health services in Tanzania. As we know, health of adolescent women is among the global priority because this is a group which is at risk of maternal mortality and morbidity, and mostly due to preventable pregnancy and childbirth complications. And uh, this is alarming, especially to the developing countries, because adolescent pregnancy accounts to about 11%. And um, we are talking about this uh, group because this is a group which is at risk of several complications including unwanted pregnancy, abortion, abuse, neglect, and sometimes premature deliveries. And the problem also is a burden even in our country because adolescent pregnancy, it is still increasing. Uh, from the data 2015 up to 2019, adolescence is persistently increasing from 20 3% up to 27% of all pregnancies in Tanzania. Next, please. Thank you. And uh, with this burden, we had our objective during our study. So we did a study which aimed to explore the barriers, enablers, influencers among adolescent women, especially in accessing uh, health care services. And uh, this was done in rural Tanzania. So we did a qualitative study uh, from July 2018 up to September 2019. And uh, we did in-depth interview among adolescent women. And uh, we included adolescent women who were pregnant at time of data collection or parenting a child below five years of age. But also we wanted to get the and explore the perception from the community so we did focus group discussion from the elder men and women and young husband who are living within the community within this uh, where these adolescents are living and also key informant interview was done to the healthcare workers where these adolescents are tending to access our uh, maternal uh, and child health services our data was analyzed by thematic approach and the information got were audio tape to recorded, translated and transcribed. Next, please. And these are our findings from power imbalance among adolescent women, whereby it has been presented on lack of maternal personal autonomy. As we know, adolescent women are dependent in most of every aspect, financially, even in decision making. They depend on family members or sometimes the partners to accompany them, to decide for them to go to the clinic. Mostly they don't uh, decide for themselves. They need somebody to support them. They need somebody to hold their hand in order to attend the antenatal clinic for maternal and healthy services. So if no one to support them, if no one uh, to make decision for them, sometimes become a problem for them to attend to antenatal clinic for health services. Another findings we go to stigma and judgment. As the community express more blame than support among these adolescents, sometimes they are very cruel, provoking on them, they are very furious, inserting them, why are you uh, young children are getting pregnant at this age, why do you have sex at this age? So it's more of judgment, it's more of stigma. So sometimes they are Friday to present themselves to the clinic to get services. Also adolescent women are reported on neglect and abuse. And this was not reported by adolescents themselves, but also the community they are living. So uh, they said sometimes you can be chased away if you're pregnant, you don't get support expected like other population. So all these making them feel inferior to go to the clinic to get the services. Next, please. Also, we got a findings on uh, vulnerability among adolescents to the health system. 
uh, most of adolescents were experienced difficult times, difficult entry to the healthy system, especially for those who don't have partner, they, the partners run away, they have dropped you from the school, the partners run away, afraid of country by law, because if you pregnanted a pupil or student, you will be imprisoned in not less than 30 years. So most of the men who impregnated these young girls, they run away. They are afraid to face a uh, country by law. So this become inconvenient because they lack support from this group, these partners. So it become difficult to go to the clinic because no support. Or sometimes the support is just depend on the family members. All these are inconvenience to adolescents to reach to the healthy facilities for services. Another thing they experienced, they reported, is limited ability to provide friendly maternal and child health services. Sometimes infrastructure is not supportive or not friendly to accommodate the need of these adolescent girls. So you find the rooms are insufficient, sometimes few number of staff. So sometimes healthcare workers need to reschedule uh, to see them in different times while the other women already left in order to save these young women. So you find they are afraid, they are ashamed, their stigma, all these make them reluctant to attend to antenatal services. Also reported on long distance to the health centers for delivery. Most of the adolescents, due to their risk, they have been encountered risk of premature delivery, risk of complication during childbirth. They are supposed to deliver to the health centers, especially for the first pregnancy. They are required to deliver on the health centers. So sometimes they don't have fare for transport to go to the health centers. So they decided to stay away the year. Sometimes they deliver in the uh, Dispensaries are fighting and they are not able to get some money to go to the health centers for the services. And some reported that sometimes the home delivery is unavoidable. So in conclusion, um, from the findings, we saw power and balance and weak health system supports sometimes compromise the adolescents assessing, assessing antenatal care services. And uh, we need interventions at multi level to the policymakers at different level from the Ministry of Health, district, regions, up to the community level in order to support adolescents to meet their need, to meet their maternal and health need. Because if we do so, we'll improve uh, maternal health. At the end of the day, uh, we'll improve the quality of life to the adolescents and to the community at large. And uh, another thing I want to share with you is experience during COVID pandemic-19. Uh, during this COVID-19 pandemic, it was a scary period, as most of the adolescents women also, it was hard for them to attend to the health uh, facilities, because at the hospital, it was the, the place where it is was easily for them to contact a disease. The place where you are at risk of getting the disease. So most of them were reluctant to come to the hospital unless it's severe. And we saw for this, for us healthcare workers, we saw different condition at a critical stage because people are delaying to attend to the hospital. And we are happy because our hospital um, Plenty on job training for healthcare workers to take more precautions on infection prevention control in order to make the health care workers safe because they are the ones who are to risk it. Also, uh, in connection with Uganda Medical Center and Catholic University, we managed to make our local personal protective equipment, gowns, face masks, sanitizer, all these were done in order to accommodate the need and this was building self-reliance, innovation, and ownership, especially in this, uh, on that uh, COVID pandemic. Thank you very much for listening. Hi, everyone. Thank you.
you, Sana, for introducing me. Today I'm going to, to present to you about communication gap, barriers for illiterate women in accessing maternal, newborn, and child health in Tanzania. As all of us know that good communication is an important channel for, success, for access to good and quality health services. In Tanzania, Swahili language is a national language. Of course, it is an official language and also is a media of teaching in primary school. But also, we have more than 120 native languages, which are the first language in each tribe. In Misungi specifically, the first language is Skuma. So most of people who have not attended to school, they can speak and understand Skuma, but not Swahili. Illiterate, illiterate in your context means that people who cannot read and write in Swahili language. In Tanzania, the level of illiteracy is 27% of women in the productive age. But in Misungi specifically, the level of illiterate is 37, which is higher compared to the national data. So that illiterate women in Misungi are less likely to receive perinatal care, which are antenatal care, skilled birth attendant, and the postnatal care. This is because illiterate people has poor understanding to health matters, poor adherence to health practice due to poor understanding of health information, including appointment dates for antenatal visits, expected dates for delivery, and the appointment for postnatal care for their babies. Next slide, please. So we conducted a qualitative study as part of our equity study, and we came up with three emerging themes. One among of them is language barrier. As I have said before, before illiterate people or illiterate women in the context of our study were those women who can only speak skuma due to lack of formal education. So if they can only speak skuma, they, they created a gap between them and the health provider. Health provider in our country, in Tanzania, there are people from different ethnic groups that they are employed in Misuni. So most of them use Swahili as a means of communication. So sometimes that you may find a health provider has an important information wants to deliver to illiterate women. So she or he is forced to use Swahili language. But because the illiterate woman cannot hear or speak Swahili, it makes it possible for her to get the exact message which was intended for her. Another theme was illiterate. Being illiterate, that you cannot read and also cannot write in Swahili. And most of the messages, most of the brochures and the public health documents are written in Swahili in our settings. So make them difficult to read them interpret them and they understand them. So most of the time, make them not able to acquire the intended information which was supposed to get. Oh, another theme was dependence. Due to inability to read or talk is Swahil, these illiterate women most of the time depends on other people who can hear and read it Swahili to help them. Explain information and translate health workers. So, and translate health workers the information which is supposed to be delivered to them. Next slide, please. Uh, 
as we know, for successful quality and respectively maternal and newborn and child health communication between health provider and illiterate women is important. So we need a good communication between these two groups. The communication which everyone will understand. So we recommend the following. First of all, we recommend we have translation that we recommend the community health workers. These are the people who are trained to help other people in their setting. They make uh, household visits for women who are pregnant and those who have newborn and have children under five years of age. These people can understand both Swahili and the Sukuma language. So they are key implementer in helping translate the Sukuma to health worker and translate Swahili to illiterate women. Also, we recommend to have a paid translator or cell phones, and also graphic illustration rather than using audios or written messages. Another recommendation is to continue emphasizing in the form of primary education, whereby if everyone, everyone will get a chance to benefit in primary education, will make it them easy to read and write Swahili, as Swahili is the means of, edu means of, edu of conducting education in Tanzania. Next slide, please. Next. Also, I would like to share a little bit of experience during COVID-19. Illiterate women, most of the time, depend on community health workers or relatives or friends to escort them or to help them to translate the message from health worker. So during the pandemic, as we know, the facilities restricted the number of people to enter in the health facility. So they had to go themselves. So they had fear. Sometimes they did not attend because they fear they could not understand what the health workers would tell them. Or if they ask them questions, they fear they could not be able to answer them properly. Also, they missed the opportunity because most of the most of the brochures, most of the public messages for precaution for COVID-19 were in Swahili, either in audio or written material. So they could not understand as it was intended for them to understand. Thank you for listening. Dismiss, the floor is yours. Dismiss, maybe you are muted. Dismas, I think you have to uh, request to speak again, and then we'll we'll be able to get you on. Very impressive presentations, like tackling the vulnerabilities from different aspects, from the education, literacy, facility-based respect, respectful care. So. I'm very impressed with the work that this team has been addressing the issue of gender with an equity lens and especially like the geographic area, very rural areas. And really these are the people who need this type of service and intervention. Yes, please dismiss, yeah. go ahead, yeah. 
sorry ladies and gentlemen it's because of uh, technical error you can imagine so uh, i would like to take you through main perspectives towards improving reproductive and child health in tanzania and uh, as you all understand most of uh, interventions over the decades uh, have been focusing on women but uh, recently it has been shown that uh, evolving men will definitely ultimately most of uh, low and middle income countries uh, many are the decision makers and breadwinners so but uh, despite a number of intervention to involve men still many a tendency towards maternal and child health care in Tanzania has been low. So we decided to go back to the drawing board and see what, what are the hindering blocks of these men to, to participate towards maternal and child health care in Tanzania. Next. So uh, we, 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 we did a, a number of focus group discussions, Swahili and the native language, and let us understand from these men. <clears throat> Next. Next. We are talking with uh, uh, with men in me in Misungwe district, and a number of them talked about uh, being excluded at the healthy facility, even if they decided to escort the uh, to the how they found themselves excluded from the uh, health from the health services that uh, their partner is intended to get so and some of them went to the extent that uh, we are left outside as the uh, watchmen with our bicycles uh, rather than uh, uh, being together with our partner so that we can receive the health education that is intended. But also we realize a lot of gender laws and norms that emerged. Uh, as uh, most of those men that were willing to, to escort their partners and to participate in a number of uh, uh, healthy services that are provided, they were thought to be charmed they were thought to be controlled by their partners or their wives. So there were several social stigmas that are directed towards men who decided to become role model or champions toward maternal and child health care. But again, a lot of expectations at the community level that there are things that a man is supposed to take care of. And this is mainly about uh, financial resources. This was thought by men as their primary law rather than any other issues. So if they can be able to take care of their family, if they can be able to provide food on the table for them, that was enough rather than going or escorting their partners to the clinic. But again, these men went further uh, to narrate that uh, they thought there were some secrets among women, that even if these uh, women are told some health information, those health information are not shared back to their partner so that they can better understand what is going on with their pregnancy. So with uh, misinformation around this, uh, most men he thought probably it is not worth it for them to participate toward maternal and child health. Next. Next. So again, a number of men uh, 
had a, a sense of fear towards the HIV testing because they thought once they escort their partner to the health facility, definitely they are going to be tested. And uh, the fear was so huge to the extent, extent that they thought, suppose they are tested positive, what will happen? Who will take care of the family? Probably the community will, be, will start to uh, stigmatize them. So they opt to shy away from whatever services that is provided to their nearby facilities. But uh, also most men felt embarrassed, especially if their partner doesn't have uh, good clothes. Uh, so they thought they needed to prepare more because their primary role is to provide the financial resources to the, to the family. They, they, they needed to have some good clothes so that they can escort their wives. So, uh, most of them had been uh, afraid to participate or to attend to the health facility just because of their self-embarrassment. But again, uh, also they went further to narrate of lack of privacy at the facility level, which uh, uh, caused some of them to, to shy away because uh, even if you are talking to uh, a health provider in a, uh, in a separate room and the number of community members, if they can uh, see you talking to the health providers, some of the health providers cannot uh, uh, hold the information that they have and they start to share with some other community members. So for them, they thought uh, if privacy and the confidentiality can be improved uh, at the facility level and to a number of health providers, uh, probably they will be ready to, to be part and parcel of improving maternal and child health care. Next. Next. So, we, we, we saw a number of uh, issues that are emerging, uh, which mainly are centered uh, towards uh, gender norms, family expectation, stigma, uh, poor treatment at the facility level, but also exclusion and lack of privacy. But uh, most men think this is the, also their role to participate because they are bloody winners and they are responsible for their family. So we think it is a high time we need to strategize out so that men becomes part and parcel of improving maternal and child health care. And this will start by listening to their concern, listening to their uh, challenges that they are facing and what are the social contexts that can be improved uh, because uh, strategies towards male engagement can vary between communities and communities depending on the, on the, on the context. But uh, we realize because of the social norms, most men will need to be sensitized and uh, uh, create awareness so that uh, some of the social stigmas and uh, some gender norms, uh, they can be collected and uh, they become part and parcel of the maternal and child health. So some of the issues, some of the facilities they've started, they developed some uh, men's corner where men can, they can be educated about pregnancy and the child care, but also some of the facility came up with uh, some innovative approach where other than just testing for HIV, these men had the opportunity to have their blood pressure checked, which has improved so significantly uh, men participation towards the maternal and child health care. Next. So thank you for listening. And Asante Sana Mwebare Munonga. Thank you so much uh, to all speakers. Very impressive presentations. And uh, we really want to thank the research teams from 
Kuhas from Must University and from University of Calgary. It's been like five years of very impressive work in the field. I've been there in the field and I was so impressed with the number of emerging researchers, with the number of teams working on the simulation training at the facilities, with the community health workers in both Misungi and Quimba districts. It is really, really one of the we are very proud of this work as IMSHA and the legacy will stay because we know that this work will be scaled up at the national level because of the good work. Before we start taking all questions, I have one question just to learn about your experience with the local health authorities. Once you discussed with them the research findings and like the main things that uh, you had experienced in your implementation, how was the response? Did this like resulted in policy or practices changes within Mwanza, within the districts that were involved? And I'd like to hear from the team if this was like there was a real policy change or practice change and how it was taken by the local authority. Thank you. So thank you. Thank you, Sana, for, for the comments and the questions. Uh, there, there are things that are happening uh, very, very uh, abruptly and very quickly, especially to the local government, but also, but also at the national level. So one of the things that is happening at the national, at the local government level, the CHW program has been there in the past and most of the program had been doing, but uh, most of these CHWs were only monitored and evaluated by only the programs. So what we did as part of the Mama Namtoto program is to link with the district. So, so that to create an ownership to the district. That means these are CHWs that are working for the district, working for the communities. So that even the database is owned by the district. Even today, the district are, are monitoring the performance of the CHWs, they are following up their uh, performance at the community and the, uh, at the facility level. So for, for us, we, we see it as a different because when we started, uh, the, the government was complaining most of the CHW programs are not sustainable. So. So we think this can be sustained because from the beginning, the district had an ownership of the CHW network that we have. But at the national level also, they are currently in a discussion because when we presented uh, at the ministerial level, the current CHW is uh, at the village level, not at the hamlet level. And with the results that we are able to share with the national government, they realize having CHWs at the hamlet level will be more manageable, but also will have an impact because these are volunteers ultimately will have spare time for them to do their family issues rather than doing all the, uh, the, 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 the volunteer work. Because two years back, the government was... Uh, piloting a, a paid CHW, which, which with the government testimony, it failed. So now they are looking how to nationalize the, the hamlet at the, the CHWs at the hamlet level with, with the findings that, that we have. So that's what is happening at the community level and at the government level. Yeah. My team you. members may add more. Um, thank you, Dismas. 
Uh, yes, uh, this is Eleanor from Uganda. Th I wanted to add um, what has uh, changed after we got these results and uh, presented to the district authorities. Um, the district teams um, included as well the health workers who are serving uh, women uh, in the communities. So one of the uh, important uh, innovations that has come up through the dissemination of these results is that uh, uh, in communities where the, uh, the number of vulnerable women is high, uh, in one health center, the health workers championed an innovation of a saving scheme uh, whereby mothers when they come for antenatal care they are encouraged to to save small money and uh, so everyone who saves the small money it keeps accumulating if the mother comes every month for antenatal care uh, every time she's depositing something in her account and when it is uh, time, according to guidelines, you know, time for preparing materials that you will need for childbirth, um, then this mother will be given what she has been what she has saved so far, so that she can go and do some shopping, buying childbirth materials, uh, you know, ensuring that she has got uh, money for transportation. So um, we are following up uh, this innovation. And we are hoping that when it becomes, uh, you know, successful, we, it can be replicated in other communities. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you. Please yeah. go ahead. And, yeah. Thank you very much. And on top of what have been explained, especially in Tanzania, uh, we observed a lot during dissemination at the community level in the villages. We saw the positivity from the village leaders. We saw the union, the togetherness among the community health workers and village leaders. They are giving each other support because they see the, the they observe the changes among the response to on attaining uh, maternal and child health services. The number has been increased. The response has been very good. So they are very positive. So they are holding hands of these community health workers because they see their, their role and the advantage they appreciate. So sometimes if there is something uh, within the community like vaccination, like malaria program issues, so they do incorporate community health workers because they are not paid. So those are the incentives, at least they are trying to, to, to to give them, to retain them, to make sure that they feel that they are cared. So they are police maker, sorry, the village leaders appreciated. Uh, the work has been done by the community health workers. And uh, the education they give to the community, at least uh, there is some changes when the community, they appreciate and they know that the Antenatal care is a big strategy to reduce uh, maternal mortality and morbidity. And uh, this has been supported from the level of Ministry of Health is because reducing maternal mortality is among our country uh, priority. So there is a lot has been done during this dissemination at the community level we saw and we observed. Thank you very much. Yes, please, Teddy. Just uh, remove. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, thanks Teddy. so much for sharing. I think I'm hard. Is it okay? Yes, yes, yes. 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 Technology is teasing some of us, but we'll yes. get there. There is no problem. This is the new normal. Yeah. So, um, as Elena presented, for us, uh, whereas Tanzania was feeding into their research was feeding into implementation, for us here in Uganda. We were looking at the sustainability, we're calling it the sustain phase, because we we're following up uh, a project that we had implemented between 2012 and 2015. So when we uh, disseminated the results, it was so exciting to the districts uh, to find that uh, more than 86% of the community health workers that had been established were still active uh, two years after the implementation. We did this uh, uh, retention uh, data collection in 2018. 
So that was so exciting and very energizing. And uh, because, you know, there are still uh, issues around sustainability of community health workers. And uh, also uh, this kind of data helps our districts to be able to advocate for community health workers. And one of the districts, the, the, the head of health services represents the region on the national level on the community health workers committee. So this, is, this information is very uh, key uh, for that kind of advocacy. Then also in another district, when we disseminated information, uh, the, the study results, you know, it was as if um, this was not their community. You know, you're looking at the, the results and you think, oh, have I been really living in this community? The issue of vulnerability was very striking. Uh, I know Elena talked about the map that we are helping the district to come up with. In uh, one of the dissemination meetings at the district, the, uh, the district health uh, requested us to help them do a map that will show uh, the most vulnerable communities uh, so that they can use that map to direct resources, either resources from the community or resources from uh, the government. Because the government talks about uh, priority areas in terms of the poorest districts in the, in the country. Then when you go to the poorest districts, you go to the poorest sub-county, those are our administrative structures. And then until you reach the most poor, vulnerable household. But then we looked at uh, the existing definition if we followed that, then we might not be able to tackle, uh, like for instance, the stagnation of maternal mortality. Because the question is, why aren't things moving, yet there is a lot of money being spent? Maybe the, th the question would be, that is why the, what the community is telling us is that we tend to think these are the vulnerable districts, these are the vulnerable communities, these are the vulnerable households, when they are actually not. Uh, so we are working on the map together with the district, and then we'll give it a description, and uh, they hope to use it uh, to reallocate resources to be able to reach out uh, to the most vulnerable women. Uh, interestingly, when we are doing uh, the data collection, they gave an example, for instance, of uh, a woman who might be living in a, a, an iron loft house, not grass touched as it is uh, uh, described in uh, the, the, the World Bank description as poor. But then maybe that person at that time when she built the house, she had the money. But at the moment when she's pregnant, she needs help. But because the definition is whoever is in a, an iron roofed house does not uh, qualify to get subsidized services, that woman might die in the house thinking that she has everything. So that was the community communicating to us. Uh, then also uh, in Elena's presentation, she talked a lot about the drinking, the alcohol consumption being too much among women and also among men. And there was a lot of emphasis uh, of this problem, especially among the fishing villages. So after dissemination, one of the districts has decided to come up with an ordinance to control the hours of opening. I am not sure of how they are going to control the amounts they are drinking, but then uh, I think what they were telling us recently is that um, they have presented their document to the government lawyer to peruse through. I think there, is, there are steps that they have to go through. So all this work that is happening on ground was because of these results, uh, so I, I really appreciate people who support research because maybe without research, we are not going to be able to make a breakthrough. Thank you. Absolutely, very well said. Uh, another question would arise on the adolescence group. And uh, it seems like the statistics shows that early marriages and uh, uh, is on the rise 
and you had uh, did a number of digital storytelling, which was very impressive how adolescents, women uh, discussed like their vulnerabilities and uh, highlighting the challenges at the health facilities to be like to have respectful care. So on the adolescent group, what's your like advice and recommendation how to best attract and keep the adolescents coming and taking the health they need from facility based perspective and from community based perspective we'd like to hear more about the adolescent early marriages and like what you're doing and what's your recommendation for the future Thank you. Thank you very much, Sana, for a very nice question. Yes, uh, adolescent pregnancy for sure is still a real problem. And uh, in addressing this, I think, as I said, we need much level in policymaker involvement from the ministry, from the regional district, up to the community level, including uh, education, education to the reproductive healthy, education on um, prevention of unintended pregnancy, because from this point is where the problem arises. Also, we need also um, standard guidelines, which favoring adolescents which favoring privacy, which prevailing, um, favoring um, uh, environment, especially from skilled staffing, <coughs> adequate staffing, and uh, sometimes to make sure that to improve our infrastructures, like having adequate number of health facilities with uh, adequate skills and equipment. All these are needed to be targeted in order to support adolescents, uh, women to attend uh, antenatal care because antenatal care is a very major strategy in, in reducing maternal mortality and morbidity. And uh, also in Tanzania, I'm happy because last year there was a law which was reviewed uh, country by law on marriage act 2019 by I think it was on October which prohibit the marriage of under 18. This is very good. The issue is on implementation. I think at this point also we need to uh, implement, we need to uh, work on and looking this area differently in order to make sure that is, this is really happening, not just uh, on papers, it's supposed to be done. And then, I think if we do all this in multiple, everybody should, if everybody is responsible at the community level, at the district level, and making use of these healthcare workers, community healthcare workers, it is very good strategies because these are the links between the community and health facilities. If we educate, if the healthcare workers provide adequate information, maybe on danger signs, maybe on complication anticipated, so the community will understand. And I agree, this will not be a short term plan, it's supposed to be a long term plan because educating somebody needs time. So I think if we join hands together from and get support from all levels, I think this is possible. And um, um, I think also we need to do more research, we need to do more follow up, we need to support each other to make this is really happening. Excellent, thank you. I can see one of the questions uh, from Halima Misungi. She said, based on your findings, do the male also can, uh, are they vulnerable, the men, males, and what does the policy and regulation stated in Tanzania? Yeah, if 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 I may respond, definitely without saying no, definitely <laughs> men can be vulnerable. It depends with uh, with the context. 
because uh, in Tanzania, like in northwestern Tanzania, we 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 understand that there are some tribes where many are beaten. Okay, <laughs> but uh, but uh, but uh, very few can come in front and open say I'm being beaten by my wife. Okay, and now with 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 the women empowerment, we see a lot of a lot of men uh, having challenges like it's led having rather thinking that uh, women empowerment as a positive attribute towards the, uh, empowering women to in accessing and utilizing care, but it becomes a threat to, to, to them. So. Uh, I think a number a number of strategies in Tanzania have been have been uh, ongoing in terms of uh, balancing because most of the time we talk of women as uh, vulnerable, but we tend to forget to for, we forget men. So a lot of is happening at the community level, but also at the government level. So like in both Misungu and Kwimba, because it, Initially, people were thinking being community it is a women job. But later we realize Yeah, sorry, we are do lot. thank you. Yeah. We are losing you this mess. Until we have this mess back, I have very interesting question from Jen Brenner, the co-PI for the two initiatives. And she say, do any presenters have one very brief finding that was unexpected and a surprise to everyone. We'd like to hear from the team. Thank you. I would like to respond to Jen's question. We had one surprising response from male engagement that male were very comfortable and proudly to escort the other other partners rather than their wife, their 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 I don't know what, can I make it their former wife, their non wife. So they were proudly to escort the side wife just because they are the side wife. They were presentable. They were clean. They can change their clothes, so they were proud to escort them rather than their home housewife. That was very surprising for us. Interesting. Any other experiences, unexpected or a surprise to everyone? Yes, Teddy. Yeah, uh, in uh, our study, when we set the criteria uh, using the World Bank definition and uh, the, w, the VHT, uh, the CHW definition, when we went to the field, I would interview these women who had been identified as vulnerable and would come back in our debrief and start asking ourselves, are we seeing the right women? Because like for me myself, the women I interviewed, this woman knows how to go through her problems. I have this problem and this is what I do. They don't wait to be given solutions or just to you know, give up on their lives. So one thing uh, we learned as a team is that um, social support is very key in whatever situation you're in. Because uh, one of the women we interviewed, someone thought maybe she was even mentally ill. But because there was social support, she was able to attend all her antenatal care 
visit because she had uh, an in-law who would come and say, hey, tomorrow we are going to the health facility. Then because I think of her situation, she had to go and deliver from a hospital kind of level of facility. All that was taken care of by the social support. Then uh, whereas the one who was interviewing that person was like, does she even understand? Like you ask how old is your, your child? Then this person tells you nine when you're seeing the child is like three, three years, but she's saying nine years. So this woman was able to narrate all that the VHT had taught her. And she said, she's very patient with me. I ask all the questions I want and she will come here several times to make sure that I understand. So maybe that is something that can help us to see how, what can we do? How can we build on uh, these kinds of facilitators like the social support to be able to work out some, uh, some innovation that can be able to help these vulnerable women. We kept on asking ourselves, we redefine, defined the, the, the protocol, you know, but the, that, that thing of psychosocial support was really standing out. Thank you. Thank you, Teddy. Any other comment from the team? I have a question from Halima Misengu. Uh, she says, what does international UNESCO declaration of a human subject stated about when you're dealing with vulnerable group like adolescents and women as participants in your study? Okay. Who? Yeah, that is an interesting question. I remember when we were uh, working out our protocol, one of the things that we were guided about was if you're going to meet the vulnerable women, you must have in place an emergency plan. Mm -hmm. So we had to revise our protocol to make sure that there is an emergency plan in case there is someone who needs uh, emergency care. And for adolescents, depending whether they are below 18 or, yeah, those ones that are below 18, of course they are children, uh, they can't consent, uh, they, there is the issue of assenting. So, uh, Julie, can you add on that? Julie? Uh, hello. Uh, so to add on to what Teddy has uh, said, um, so the declaration on uh, research in human subjects, um, we are supposed to follow the principles of ethics, in, including uh, uh, respect for persons, uh, including justice, um, and uh, we try to address those issues when we are planning um, to do research and indeed we um, we approached uh, this research with care as you have heard Teddy say that uh, um, the research ethics committee uh, here in Uganda for example uh, was able to remind us uh, of the need uh, to have uh, um, a, a procedure or a protocol that would help to support vulnerable women if there was need. Uh, I think interesting, um, interesting is that related to that protocol, that uh, support or that emergency care that might be needed. Um, uh, of course, um, the, those who collected the data were trained uh, to be sensitive uh, in conversation, interv in interviewing uh, the vulnerable women and uh, uh, I think what we, was interesting for me is uh, to see that uh, sometimes uh, we think that a person who is vulnerable is, is breaking down all over the place every time you ask about their situation. Uh, but uh, interestingly that uh, these uh, women 
were calm. Uh, I think also because, as uh, Teddy explained, that we realized that some of them, in fact, uh, in the context of our research, that some of them, because of the support around them in terms of uh, the support from the family, the support from the community health workers, uh, that they, yeah, they, they are able to access services. Um, they are not um, totally broken, right? So in a way, um, that in itself sort of sets them apart, but of course we would never have known until we have gone to the community. So yes, we do take care of those, um, that guidance that we are given to respect people. Uh, and moreover, uh, maybe to add that uh, also research uh, principles say that uh, there should be um, balance of the risks and benefits and that we should not just re do research in one group um, that is maybe vulnerable and leave others who are likely to benefit from the research. Uh, but this specific study, in fact, intended to understand the situation of the vulnerable population populations and um, as they were perceived to be most in need of services and therefore the research results, the findings and the actions thereof uh, would benefit this group. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Juliet. Any other comment from the team? I don't have more questions. I don't see questions. So I'll give the floor for the team if they like to add something that uh, uh, they want to highlight before we end this webinar. And thank you very much, Isana. Also, uh, on top of that, uh, about research issues, yeah, for adolescents, sometimes we um, we concert they provide concert and the answer uh, it depends on the age according to research guidelines and the ethical committee issues so sometimes you may find during data collection you go to the adolescent and um, start crying from what she has been through so if happened sometimes like that so we try to make her down we tried to make uh, her feel comfortable and sometimes we postponed and said, maybe we can visit you tomorrow. If you'll be ready, you can still concert, continue. But if you don't feel OK, it's fine. So we tried uh, in such a situation. And we found that situation because to the adolescents who um, had passing through neglect, abuse, there's a lot within the community. So we make sure that we follow the research committee guidelines, what we are supposed, what was supposed to be done and making sure that we respect the humanity and dignity of everybody. Thank you, Juliet. So, yeah, please dismiss, go ahead. Yeah, 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 maybe to add from the adolescent side, as I've said before, a lot of uh, issues, things are happening and the government is trying to embark uh, on, on that. Uh, because uh, like uh, uh, some of the issues the government is doing is to uh, improve enrollment of girls to school, which uh, the government uh, each year is planning to enroll more girls to school so that uh, from primary from primary school and secondary school. So that uh, with the assumption that if they spend their time in school, probably the adolescent uh, pregnancy might come out. And now the government now is pushing towards uh, building boarding schools rather than day in school. Every village should have a school. So a lot of is happening. But at the facility level again, uh, most district hospitals have started having youth-friendly uh, sections dedicated specifically to provide reproductive and uh, reproductive health. So I think uh, if this is uh, advocated and 
sensitized they they will be they will be utilized more by by youth and the, and the adolescent but at the community level uh, initially before we started the intervention most primary health care facilities had the only specific days for antenatal care and the postnatal care but once we realize all these challenges uh, health managers in this district and the uh, various primary health care they decided to space out the antenatal and the postnatal care so that a woman is free any day to be able to access the health facilities and uh, and this has, uh, has improved significantly the antenatal and the postnatal care, postnatal care deliveries. But uh, since, because initially there were a number of social stigmas, either from the uh, health providers or from the community level, uh, most of these CHWs, but also health providers, underwent a training on respective care. So issues of privacy, secrecy, confidentiality, uh, and, and how to improve, how to restructure the facilities so that it can accommodate adolescent and all other women, uh, they, 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 they took place. And a number of restructuring of these facilities in the undergoing at the local government, but also at the national at the national level. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you so much, Dismas. I I want to wrap up and thank you. Thank you very much, our speakers. Very informative, and we learned a lot from you today. Thank you, Dismas and Jen, because you led these two research projects successfully. And really, it's one of the IMSHA projects that we are really proud of it. And thank you for our audience today. Thank you for joining us from all across Canada, from Africa, from different parts of the world. I hope that we could convey the message to you and we highlighted issues that you were interested to hear today. And we conclude this session and looking forward for another IMSHA presentations to showcase the good work that has been done within the 28 research projects within IMSHA. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nafa. Thank you, Sana. Thanks, everybody, and we conclude the session. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much.